Well, thank all of you for coming on this wonderful summer afternoon in Washington. Uh, my name is Ed Chow. I'm the, uh, a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. And we have the distinct honor of welcoming uh, to two friends, a old friend and a new friend, uh, to talk about a subject that clearly is of much interest, uh, which is that as, as China's uh, economic weight and its energy demand and import requirements have grown, we have clearly seen its footprint uh, in terms of its international trade and investments around the world grow at the same time. Um, and, and financing in particular has been a topic of much interest. Um, everyone realized that financing is involved with uh, uh, China's investments uh, in overseas uh, uh, energy projects, but none of us really quite understand how exactly it works. Uh, and we have the great pleasure of, of hosting uh, the authors of, of studies, two studies um, that are available, uh, if you didn't pick it up, uh, as you came in, uh, printouts of that also on our website, uh, that delves into the subject uh, rather deeply. It's probably the most systematic and comprehensive study I've seen certainly in, in, in English, maybe in Chinese too. I don't know if Bo can tell us about that. So it, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Bo Kong, Professor Bo Kong from the University of Oklahoma and Kevin Gallagher from Boston University. I think Bo, you're gonna start first. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Ed, uh, for that introduction. And uh, also, before I get started, uh, I also would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to uh, Sarah Ladislaw and, and Lisa Highland, uh, my colleagues of uh, the Energy and National Security team here, for hosting us. Uh, and, and also, I would like to express my gratitude to my colleague, Kevin Gallagher, for inviting me to be part of the project, we has, which has been uh, intellectually rewarding um, and uh, I'm just delighted to be back at CSS and uh, to share the, result, the results of our work today. And um, our study begins with a very simple um, observation. That is, uh, over the past 15 years or so, China has globalized its footprint. And the evidence becomes overwhelming if you look at China's role as a global exporter of energy technologies and energy equipment and products and services. And also, um, if you take a look at China's contribution to uh, the global energy markets in terms of uh, greenfield investment and uh, mergers and acquisitions. Now, let's take a quick look at China's role as an energy exporter. Uh, con contra contradictory to some conventional wisdom, China is also emerging as a leading uh, exporter of energy technologies and equipment. Uh, in relative terms, China now um, provides exports uh, over half of what the U.S. exports to the rest of the world. Um, between 2000 and 2013, China has provided over almost a half a trillion in energy to the, re to the rest of the world. Um, in specific areas such as hydro um, equipment um, and photovoltaics, China actually is the world's largest exporter. As you, as you look at um, China's export of PV and hydropower, uh, China actually exports four to five times more than the United States does to the rest of the world. Even in the area of um, thermal power plants, China exports roughly two times more than the United States. Um, this means that China actually is a leading exporter uh, and uh, with, um, with this attempt to export more capacity and, and we um, are confronted with this question as to whether this trend will continue or not. And certainly this is something we can uh, have more discussion in the Q&A. And when we turn, now let's shift gears and take a look at China's role as a capital provider. And here, um, China has, uh, in a short span of time, 
uh, emerged as a global leader in, in energy finance. And its contribution is divided into two categories. Uh, if you look at its greenfield investment, um, essentially, uh, you see a difference between what has happened between 2000, prior to 2007 and 2008. I think this is also true with respect to China's contribution in mergers and acquisitions. And clearly, the 2008 marked as a watershed. And, and after the global financial crisis, China has um, provided the world with a massive amount of uh, uh, finance that has led to the boom of, uh, of commodities in many, many respects, although the timing is not necessarily in China's favor, uh, in the timing is not necessarily good. As you know, the, the, the so-called uh, commodity super cycle pretty much ended uh, with the global financial crisis. But uh, between 2000 and 2015, China uh, collectively uh, in two areas uh, provided over two, almost over, almost uh, uh, over a quarter billion, a quarter trillion dollars to the global energy markets, and in terms of uh, um, in terms of the geographic distribution of China's energy export, uh, it has pretty much gone into every corner of the world. In terms of its greenfield energy investment, the overwhelming amount of its greenfield energy investment went to emerging economies. In contrast, the, the majority of its mergers and acquisitions actually took place in, in industrialized economies. Needless to say, um, the, the, the evidence um, is quite uh, overwhelming um, with respect to the globalization of, of um, China's energy sector. There thus arises um, this uh, research question that motivates our, our project. That is, how has China financed the global expansion of its energy companies? Um, and, and our central claim uh, is that state finance constitutes the primary uh, support for the globalization of Chinese uh, energy sector between 2000 and 2015. And to make the, uh, to substantiate this claim, I make um, essentially uh, two arguments. First, I argue that um, the role of the state uh, essentially is dictated by the fundamental reality that capital markets in China are kept from playing a meaningful role. And this essentially leaves the state as the default choice. Now the question is whether the state has the ability. My argument is that the ability of the state to play uh, a leading role or the most important role in financing the globalization of Chinese energy sector derives from the fundamental reality that it controls both its SOEs and state-owned financial institutions at the same time. And secondly, it also uh, keeps its financial system largely closed. I argue that these two factors have enabled the state to play the most prominent role in financing the globalization of its energy sector. And while financing the global expansion of Chinese energy companies, the Chinese state has essentially turned the country into a global leader in energy finance. And this certainly carries a lot of implications as the Chinese government uh, accelerates its go, its go out strategy and implements its one road, one belt initiative which I'm happy to discuss further in the Q&A as well. Now, let me uh, walk you through my, my argument. And first, let's take a quick look at the, the role of capital markets. As I argued that capital markets are essentially kept from playing a meaningful role. And to understand this, I think we have to preface, preface by saying that uh, capital markets have grown and expanded rapidly over the past 15 years or so. Essentially, I'm talking about the two types of capital markets. One is the corporate bond market, and another is the equity market. Both have seen a, 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 a massive expansion in China over the past uh, decade or so. Um, in fact, if you look at the chart on the left, uh, it, it basically, uh, on the left from your side, 
it, it portrays this rapid expansion of the corporate bond market between 2009 and 2014, which essentially um, is, um, it amounts to a 14-fold increase by market value. A uh, corporate bond market now accounts for one-third of the bond market in China, which is the third largest in China. In terms of the equity market, uh, since the beginning of the century, when the three national oil companies in China got listed on domestic and international stock markets, the equity markets have also become uh, increasingly accessible for energy companies in China. And this chart on the right um, it illustrates the amount of uh, uh, funding uh, renewable energy companies have raised in China between 2006 and 2012. And, um, and, and you can tell that uh, uh, now energy companies in China are increasingly able to uh, raise funds from the capital markets. In, in fact, in 2010, at the peak time, there were 28 renewable energy companies listed in the Chinese stock markets, and there were also 31 Chinese renewable energy companies listed in overseas capital markets. As you can tell, you know, as China uh, is more uh, deeply integrated into the global financial markets, uh, its energy companies are able to raise, to rely on both domestic capital markets and international capital markets. But why, why is it that uh, the capital markets are not able to play a, um, a, 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 a sufficient role in, in financing and the global expansion of Chinese energy companies? Well, the, the fundamental reason is that if you look at the, the bond market, the bond market actually is fundamentally biased in favor of SOEs, state-owned enterprises. In fact, the over 90% of the corporate bonds issued in China are issued by those SOEs. And if you look at the financing cost, there is certainly a great uh, differentiation between uh, what it costs for the SOEs to raise money versus what it costs uh, for the private companies to raise, raise money from the capital markets. And what about the, the, uh, the equity markets? Well, the equity markets in China are subject to um, uh, political intervention as evidenced by nine uh, closures of this, the stock markets between 1990, 1995 and, uh, 1994 and 2015. Moreover, the stock markets in China are also characterized by lengthy regulatory uh, approval procedures, which also leads to rent seeking. Because of these problems, uh, the, cap, the equity markets are also unable to play a, a, um, a leading role in the financing of China's global energy expansion. In fact, as you can tell, uh, over the past couple of years, the amount of money, the amount of funding Chinese companies raise from the stock markets at home actually have been on the decline. You certainly have seen a lot of fluctuations, but the overall trend is quite clear. You see a decline of the amount of funding Chinese companies are able to raise from domestic markets. Um, in turn, they have turned to uh, foreign stock markets, but only a very, very few select companies are able to meet the demands of the international capital markets to raise money uh, uh, overseas. And as a result, um, the capital markets actually uh, are reduced uh, the importance of capital markets is reduced uh, in terms of uh, its ability to finance the global expansion of Chinese energy companies. And this essentially, as I said, leaves the state as the default choice. But does the state have the capability? Well, the secret to the state's capability is that it simultaneously controls its energy uh, state-owned enterprises and its state-owned financial institutions. And here I mapped out the bureaucracies um, um, that are, are pertinent to the control of these SOEs and uh, state financial institutions. Uh, essentially, you have different bureaucracies that uh, uh, have uh, uh, power over these SOEs, and then you have different bureaucracies that have power over the state financial institutions. But the secret actually has to do with the, the control over personnel the CCP has over the top executives of both the SOEs and the state financial institutions. In fact, the, the CCP Human Resources Department 
uh, the central organization department essentially appoints the top managers of the uh, energy SOEs and state financial institutions as if they are government bureaucrats. And in turn, they get bureaucratic, they get bureaucratic ranking uh, similar to those government, uh, similar to those bureaucrats inside the Chinese government. And therefore, this power over personnel gives the Chinese government, gives the Chinese state the ability to, to synchronize the actions of the Chinese energy, SOEs, and Chinese state financial institutions. And now, with this ability, you may wonder, how does the Chinese state actually carry out its, uh, its financial support for the global expansion of its energy companies? I argue that, we argue that there are actually three forms of state financial support. And the first uh, takes the form of uh, fiscal budget or fiscal finance, and the second takes the form of uh, uh, state-owned state lending or commercial lending from state-owned commercial banks, and the third one takes the form of policy financing. Now, let me turn to the first one. I argue uh, out of the three, um, uh, fiscal financing actually plays a very, very symbolic role. As some of you may recall, um, prior to 2007, the Chinese government essentially forfeited the opportunity to take to collect dividends from the SOEs. And starting from 2007, the Chinese government reversed that practice and in turn it used that revenue to add a line item in its central budget to support the global expansion of Chinese companies. And a lot of that, some of that goes to the support of Chinese, glo the, glo the global expansion of Chinese energy companies. And here I've uh, tabulated the amount of funding uh, from the central budget used to support the global expansion of Chinese energy companies. As you can tell, the amount actually is very, very symbolic. According to the Ministry of Finance, between 2000 uh, and 2015, uh, the total amount is less than $5 billion. Uh, in, in, in light of the over um, a quarter trillion dollars uh, Chinese companies have in invested overseas, this is a really a drop of, of a bucket, a drop of water in the ocean, right? And what about, what about the role of state-owned commercial banks? As you know, that uh, the Chinese financial system is pretty much a bank-dominated financial system. And you may, you may wonder that these banks may play a, a much more prominent role. However, the reality is that there is regulatory in, constraint in place prior to 2008, uh, according to which the uh, state-owned financial, uh, state-owned commercial banks uh, were not able to lend uh, for acquisition purposes of, for, uh, you know, acquisition uh, by Chinese companies. And mor moreover, and the, when, after 2008, the, when the ban was lifted, they were only able to um, provide acquisition lending. That's uh, less than 50% of the total cost of the mergers and acquisitions. For, for a period of no, for a period of, of less than five years. And these regulatory constraints essentially uh, reduced the importance of these uh, state-owned commercial banks. As a result, they are a little bit stronger instrument for the Chinese state, but their role is uh, definitely not sufficient. To, uh, to, meet the, uh, re to meet the needs of Chinese energy companies that have expanded over the past decade also. And I will actually come back and show you uh, some um, uh, more statistics later on. And in fact, here you can tell as uh, if, if you focus on the, the, um, the amount of uh, um, uh, the share of Chinese banks um, in the country's total financing structure, um, their role has, has actually declined over time. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, because of the competition from other sources, we may see this uh, uh, further decline in the future. And this leaves, uh, the, um, this leaves the third player um, to be discussed. That is the role of, of uh, policy banks. And out of the three, we, we argue the policy banks constitute the financial anchor for the global expansion of Chinese energy companies. And um, created, in 19, created in the mid-1990s, and these policy banks uh, are, are used to support the uh, implementation of state priorities, uh, 
And here I'm particularly focusing on the China Development Bank and China Export and Import Bank. As you can tell, based on uh, the empirical work my colleague uh, uh, um, Professor Gallagher has done at the BU, and in comparison uh, with other banks, the CDB and Exim, Exim Bank are the largest players in terms of their role in financing overall Chinese overseas investment. And this basically allows me to say that the Chinese, uh, the policy banks are the biggest players. And in fact, I have more specific evidence to substantiate that claim when you take a look at the role of these banks in their lending to foreign governments uh, for energy purposes. And collectively, between 2000 and 2014, these banks, these two banks, have uh, provided at least uh, $128 billion to governments around the world uh, in connection with energy investment. And out of the $128 billion, two-thirds actually came from the CDB. This means the CDB essentially is the most prominent player behind the global expansion of Chinese energy companies over the past decade also. And essentially, it's the financial anchor. If you want to understand the global globalization of the Chinese energy sector, you really have to understand the role of the CDB. Now, let, let me uh, uh, take, a, uh, take a couple minutes to do a mini case study of the CDB so that we understand how the CDB works. If you take a look at the CDB, CDB essentially was created as a domestic bank, domestic uh, as a policy bank that, that was designed to, to uh, facilitate development at home. But over time, the CDB has not only turned itself into the financial anchor of China's urbanization, but has also turned itself into the global leader in energy finance. And you can tell that CDB now uh, has, the, the, uh, has more um, foreign exchange loans than any other bank in China, but it only captures a market share of 5.4%. Uh, as opposed to these uh, larger state financial, state commercial banks. So how does the CDB uh, fund itself? If you took, take a look at the empirical data, it's clear, it's, it's, it's clear that the CDB essentially is a bond-based bond bank. And here, the pie chart tells you that the CDB draws 70% of its, its funding from, uh, from financial bonds. And it, it, it draws some uh, of its funding from uh, deposits and, and financial borrowing, borrowing. But here I want to note the, the financial deposits are different from the financial depo deposits you tend, to, you tend to have in mind. In fact, as my colleague Pete Bottelier uh, points out, that the, the financial deposit, you know, the CDB does not take financial deposits. These financial deposits actually took the form of negotiated loans in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And in fact, you know, the limited opening of the Chinese financial system has also enabled the CDB to borrow, to, to sell bonds internationally. As you can tell, you know, not only is CDB the largest bond issuer at home, but it also uh, increasingly sells bonds to the international capital markets. What does, the mean? what does this all mean? This means that the CDB essentially has become the, the financial anchor for the global expansion of Chinese energy companies through a financial engineering process. This financial engineering process essentially transfers public savings to the CDB through commercial banks and state-owned financial enterprises that are required to purchase the financial bonds of the CDB. Moreover, as the CDB increasingly sells bonds to the international capital markets. The households, international households from around the world are also helping to finance the activities of the CDB through international financial institutions that essentially purchase the financial bonds of the CDB. And the secret behind all this is that CDB enjoys sovereign rating because of the implicit support from the Chinese state. As a result, the CDB essentially has joined the private club of available to only a few international inst financial institutions in the United States. That is, it's able to raise money at a very, very low cost. So what shapes the behavior of the CDB? We argue essentially the CDB responds to three sets of, uh, uh, three sets of factors. 
national strategy, organizational interest, and individual influence. What we essentially are trying to say is that CDB is not a puppet of the Chinese state, although it is a, it is a policy bank designed to facilitate the implementation of state priorities. Yes, it does respond to the national strategy of going out, the national strategy of energy security initiatives, the national, national strategy of uh, uh, foreign exchange diversification and renminbi internationalization. Nevertheless, the CDB also has its own organizational interest, particularly after the CDB was compelled to go through the, finish, the commercial reform after 2008, although that, that financial reform never took place. Nevertheless, the CDB was under enormous pressure to raise money to find alternative sources of, of revenue growth. And that, to some extent, explains why the CDB charges a higher interest rate than the World Bank and its peers um, internationally when it engages in international lending. And the chart below essentially compares the interest rate charged by the CDB and the World Bank. And it's clear that the CDB charges uh, a higher rate. As my colleague uh, uh, Deborah uh, uh, Brotigas will say that CDB, the China Development Bank does not do development because it's different from China Exim Bank in that it does not give uh, concessionary loans. It actually charges a higher rate. And to understand this, you really have to understand its organizational interests. You also have to understand the institution from an individual point of view. Between 1998 and 2013, Chen Yuan, son of uh, 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 one of the most important uh, uh, policy, economic policymakers, Chen Yuan in China, um, man, was the chairman of the CDB under his leadership uh, the CCB, the CDB, um, essentially tried to become, to build itself into a chief investment bank like Goldman Sachs. And so when CDB lands, when CDB uh, issues lending to state-owned energy companies, it actually is, it has very much a hands-on approach. It's heavily involved in the design of the project, in the implementation of the project. In fact, under, this, under Chen Yuan's leadership, the CDB took initiative to reach out to Brazil, to reach out to Russia, and to reach out to Venezuela. All those energy-backed loans took place under Chen Yuan's leadership at his own personal initiative. So in that, in that sense, the CDB CDB is really, the CDB really has three different phases. It responds to national strategy, but it also has its own organizational interest, and moreover, it, what it does also reflects the individual preference of this, this prominent leader. What does this lead us? Well, in short, I think, uh, I hope I've uh, uh, portrayed a, 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 a picture that, that um, um, that has a clear conclusion that is uh, um, the global expansion of Chinese energy companies is not an outcome of accident. Instead, it's an outcome of coordinated state financial support. And the state is able to play such a prominent role, largely because that the capital markets have some structural fundam fundamental structural weaknesses. And this reflects the deep-rooted uh, past dependency that favors state-owned enterprises in the Chinese political system. And moreover, it's able to play, the state is able to play a prominent role, largely because it keeps the system largely controlled, while making, while opening the system up to the state, the, the, the players that are able to, to uh, grow their strengths on the basis of the opening. While supporting the global expansion of Chinese energy companies, the CDB certainly has become the leader of global energy finance, as my colleague, Professor, Keller, Professor Gallagher, will show you later on. And this carries enormous implications for what might happen in the future as China accelerates this going out strategy, as China uh, tries to implement this one road, one belt strategy. Um, the, prince, the core idea behind that is essentially an effort to, to export capacity and uh, to build infrastructure around the world. And who is going to finance all these projects? And based on our study, I think we, are, we, are, we, um, we certainly see a growing and, and stronger role of the CDB, particularly after the CDB has been now turned into a policy bank. And Chen Yuan is no longer the head of the organization. That means that uh, essentially 
uh, the CDB does, no, does not have a strong leader anymore, and that also takes away the organizational interest a little bit. Now, so the CDB going forward is more likely uh, a, a, a much, much more obedient player in the Chinese political system. And with that, I hope I've uh, provoked enough, uh, enough uh, questions and look forward to your, present, your, your, Q, your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bo Gong. Professor Gallagher. Thank you. We're going to switch it out. Yeah. Just hit escape. I know what I'm doing. Okay. Got it. Did you get all that? Yep, I'm done. <laughs> it's over. Well, again, like my colleague Bo Kong, I uh, want to thank CSIS for uh, for hosting us here, and thank all of you for coming here on a on a beautiful day. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Bo Kong on these two papers. These two papers are I direct something at Boston University called the Global Economic Governance Initiative, where a policy research shop that does work on financial stability, human development, and the environment. And our biggest project is something called China's Global Reach, that tries to look at the China's economic impacts outside of China, around the world. And that's where these two papers uh, come from. The one that uh, Bo and I did that he presented uh, focuses more on the underlying Chinese financial system and how it supports the going out of China's OFDI, its Overseas Foreign Direct in Investment. And I will focus on the second paper, uh, which examines the extent to which the China's two policy banks are directly globalizing themselves. So the extent to which the CDB and the Export-Import Bank of China are providing financing to foreign governments and state-owned enterprises in other countries uh, in the global energy sector. I'll make three points. Uh, one, China's emerged as, you know, if, you, if you say that the, analog, the, the, the comparison group of the China Development Bank uh, and to some extent the Export-Import Bank of China are the World Bank and the Multilateral Development Banks and to a certain extent also some of the export credit agencies around the world. Um, if you compare them uh, with the China Development Bank and the Export Bank of China, China is actually the uh, leader in global development finance according to the estimates that we put together for this paper uh, and in energy finance in particular. Um, however, especially in 2016, looking at 2017, uh, this brand new portfolio that these two banks have is exposed to a heck of a lot of risk in terms of macroeconomic risk, climate risk, social risk, and reputational risks uh, for the banks themselves. Uh, to be positive, if, if China can rebalance these risks, and because of some of the control mechanisms that, uh, that uh, Professor Kong talks about, it might be easier for them to address some of these than, say, an MDB might be. If they could rebalance uh, some of these risks, they could really be poised to be a leader in a global energy transition. So first, let's, uh, let's take these three points uh, one by one. Uh, if, I know there's been a lot of focus. The last talk I came to here at the CSIS was uh, uh, all this discussion about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and maybe it'll be really big, and maybe someday it'll be uh, as large as the World Bank. Well, China, the Export-Import Bank of China and the China Development Bank hold $2 trillion in assets. If you compare that to the MDBs, is around 700 to a trillion dollars in assets, so they're already twice as large uh, as the family of the MDBs. The first two bars that you have here are just the international assets that the CDB and the Export-Import Bank have, which are around $569 billion, or three quarters of what the MDBs have in the world economy. In addition to the uh, uh, trillion dollars, excuse me, the $560 billion that they have uh, in assets and for, in loans to foreign countries, China has also set up a whole host of bilateral and regional funds uh, across the world. There's sort of equity, some of them are equity funds, some of them are, uh, are, are grant agencies. And here's a, here's a global map of them, and they're globally distributed as well. Uh, the largest region is, is Asia. Uh, there's a Silk Road fund that has $40 billion in it that's currently housed at the People's Bank of China. Um, but there's also a, a greening the Silk Road fund and, and other funds related to that. The second largest family of funds is actually in Latin America. There's a huge CELAC China investment fund of $20 billion and a specific 
specific funds for industrial transformation and specific funds for infrastructure development. There's about 12, uh, $22 billion worth of funds in Africa and, uh, and a handful in Eurasia. And over the past few months, they've created two funds to support, one, the sustainable development goals, and two, something related to the, um, uh, to the, Paris, to the Paris Agreement, the South-South Climate Fund, which is China's answer to the, to the Green Climate Fund or the Global Climate Fund uh, created by the West after the, after the, the Paris COP. Up in the upper Europe or left-hand corner here, and, and, and indeed we do have obviously the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is not China's bank, but uh, it, does, it does hold the majority of the shares. It's almost like uh, the Inter-American Development Bank in the United States, in, in the Western Hemisphere, which is largely dominated in terms of shares uh, and voting with the U.S. The AIB is really going to be analogous to that, and it hopes to have a subscribed capital of $100 billion. Uh, and, the new, and already gave its first loans uh, in May, and the new development bank, formerly referred to as the BRICS Development Bank, which China only has a fifth of the share uh, in, also started to uh, give its, gave its first family of loans in April alongside the spring meetings here, all a bunch of sustainable infrastructure loans, interestingly enough. Um, so these, these data you can get from, uh, from, the, uh, from the annual reports and uh, websites of the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank. However, the, these banks, unlike their Western counterparts, they don't publish uh, in a transparent manner the project-level data for, for what's out there. And so there's all sorts of estimates and all sorts of confusion about what's out there, and we took it upon ourselves over the past two years to try to build a database on what is China's global energy exposure uh, across the world. Uh, with the Inter-American Dialogue down the street since 2012, I've maintained a, a database on all of CDB and export and the China Export Import Bank loans to Latin American countries. And my colleague over here at uh, SAIS, uh, Deborah Brodigam at the China Africa Research Initiative, uses the same methodology and, and, uh, and has estimates on Africa. So we took the energy from both of those two databases and then used our methodologies, which is uh, really tough economic journalism, looking at CDB bulletins, looking at finance ministry bulletins, looking at the balance sheets that they send to the IMF and the SEC and so forth, and then having interviews with folks to uh, see if these things are really on their balance sheets. It takes a heck of a long time. Um, and we, we won't say that we have it down to the last dime. We actually just found out uh, in the CDB case how, how far off we are. Um, but according to that methodology, in between 2007 and 2014, China's two banks, and two-thirds of it is the CDB, uh, lent upwards of $118 billion to foreign governments around the world in the energy sector. Um, and uh, that's on par, uh, just about the same amount of what the MDBs do uh, across the world. It's also global. It's globally, di globally distributed. This denominator here has $127 billion. That's the number that, that, uh, that Bo Kong uh, noted, because uh, that goes all the way back to 2005, whereas this one's just 2007, um, because you, can, you can't compare. Uh, the MDBs don't have all their data online uh, past uh, 2007. Um, but the World Bank does. And so if you just compare China, the two China banks and their financing to uh, co countries around the world, um, it's about $128 billion since 2005, uh, dwarfing the World Bank's uh, lending during the same period. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty global, uh, concentrated largely in Asia and in Latin America, secondly. On the Asia end, it's uh, financing what uh, folks around here call China Marshall's Plan, what they call the Belt Road Initiative, which is a whole network of energy infrastructure projects across, uh, across the traditional Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, and even getting into parts of North Africa. This is a great map of a great institute in Germany called Merix that uh, has been really tracking a lot of this work. If you look, go back to our database, it's really about power plants. Uh, there are some uh, refineries in Ecuador uh, and some distribution uh, networks and, and, uh, um, and pipelines in, in Angola and, and Ethiopia, but the, about 80 percent of all China's China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank finance to countries around the world is in the uh, power generation sector. And in the power generation sector, it's basically all about coal and hydroelectric power plants. 93% of all of China's power plant finance 
uh, across the world is in coal and uh, hydro. Sorry, those circles move down. They're supposed to be up at the 66% in coal and uh, up to the 27% uh, the for hydro, which stands in stark contrast with the, uh, with the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, and the Asian Development Bank. Mo most of those banks have, uh, have clear policies that where they're, they're, except for in certain somewhat extreme circumstances, they're not funding coal of any kind. Um, and when they are into hydro, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's significantly different. Um, so um, on one level, China should really be applauded for this policy bank or development bank finance that it has around the world. It's literally doubled the amount of energy finance for developing countries around the world. Uh, this is something that the MDBs have struggled to do. They've been demanding uh, increases in capital, but, cap but Congress and other forces have, have, have not granted those uh, capital increases, even as in the case of the Inter-American Development Bank, where the developing countries in Latin America wanted to increase it with their money um, and say the United States didn't need to. The U.S. would have still had a vote power it would have been their money and our decisions um, but uh, but they've really struggled to increase the amount of capital and they're really going to struggle to meet these sustainable development goals and to meet the uh, uh, meet the Paris commitments in terms of climate finance so on one level China has doubled the amount of energy uh, but we'll, we argue if you compare it to a number of risk factors uh, that it's in significantly it's a significantly risky portfolio uh, on the macroeconomic or sovereign risk level, uh, if you take the top 20 countries that are recipients of Chinese energy finance, Russia, Brazil, India, Ecuador, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, Indonesia, et cetera, these top 20 countries are 98% of China's all energy finance. 13 of them uh, the World Bank doesn't even finance because they see them as too risky. And if you take the average uh, OECD risk, uh, zero to 10 uh, indicator, the World Bank portfolio has a uh, non-weighted average of about 5.25, whereas the China Development Banks and the Export-Import Banks about 6.4. So it's uh, heavily invested in commodities exporters that have uh, seen a real dip in their commodities exports, seen a real dive in their exchange rates, and most of these are uh, denominated in dollars, and they're having a hard time uh, paying some of this back. Uh, they're also heavily exposed in the coal sector. Like I said, 66% of all the power plants are in coal. 58% of those coal plants are subcritical, cons considered the most, uh, the most uh, carbon dioxide intensive. Uh, colleagues at Tufts University took our database and calculated the annual emissions of the fleet of Chinese coal plants, uh, Chinese finance coal plants ar around the world, and they summed to about 594 million metric tons. Uh, just to put that into context, the sum of all China's coal plants around the world would put them the eighth largest global emitter ahead of the UK, Canada, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. Uh, we then used uh, IRENA's conservative uh, estimates of the social cost of carbon, both in terms the, uh, of the localized air pollution impacts for local communities and the global costs in terms of climate change. And uh, those costs at, at the low end would be about $29 billion on an annual basis. Over a 30-year life of these plants, if you have a discount rate of around 7%, the annual cost, uh, the total cost is about $117 billion. If you believe Nick Stern and think it should be closer to zero, uh, the costs are about $892 billion. Now, those costs are social costs to communities and costs to the global economy, but they also bring significant risk to the balance sheet of these two banks because coal is increasingly a stranded asset in the world economy. There's hardly, uh, th there are hardly any, any development or public banks that will finance coal, and they're increasingly under scrutiny uh, across the world. This is a picture, uh, the picture down here on the left uh, is uh, one, uh, a very controversial Chinese finance coal plant in Bangladesh, where it's uh, subject to daily protests and Twitter accounts from Washington-based NGOs all over the place have become a global, uh, global, um, globally controversially project, and uh, it slowed down the process considerably. And some folks estimate that if for every day that the project is uh, isn't up and running, it costs a couple million dollars. Um, and there's a very good chance that this, this project will never come to fruition. The Chinese have, uh, have invested a significant amount. So there's risk to the global economy with this finance, but it's also a big risk to China's balance sheet. Same is the case with this social risk. Uh, another study that our, our institute did looked at uh, Chinese finance in Latin America. Um, doesn't get talked about as, uh, as much, but it really is a significantly strategic uh, area for the, 
for the Chinese. Um, and this, uh, this shows the, the northern part of South America, uh, largely the Andes and, and Brazil. And all of the little uh, blue spots are Chinese finance projects that are, have either happened recently or are in the pipeline to happen over the next few years. Uh, the triangles are dams, the diamonds are mines, although they're not diamond mines, they're more copper and iron ore. Um, and the oil concessions are the little, uh, little, little bubbly spots. There's a significant amount of uh, finance uh, going into here. But you'll also notice that many of them are in areas that are very green. And those are some are considered biodiversity hotspots in the world economy, where some of the most highly protected and highly concentrated areas of biodiversity. Now, there are also many of them also overlap with golden areas, and those golden areas are uh, UNESCO designated areas because they're concentrated with heavy, uh, high levels of indigenous people. And m almost every one of these projects that uh, overlaps in a high, highly bi biodiverse area and a highly indigenous uh, populated area uh, becomes the, the source of social and environmental conflict for the Chinese banks while they're there. So this brings risk to the local communities, it brings risk to the, to the environment, uh, but it is also affecting uh, China's balance sheet. Uh, some Chinese banks are involved in a, the infamous Belamonte Dam project in, uh, in, in Brazil, which uh, protesters are stopping this thing. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, Reuters estimates that it costs $3 million a day for this project uh, for every day that protesters close it down. Um, the IFC pulled out of a project that the Chinese, uh, the Sino Hydro, financed by the Export-Import Bank of China, was involved with in, in Honduras. Um, and China decided to absorb, Chinese banks decided to absorb the rest of it. Um, and protesters eventually shut that whole thing down, and the Chinese left $2 billion on the table on that particular project. And so not only are these social and environmental risks for communities, countries, and the global economy, but again, also for the balance sheet. And I add to the title of this slide, this, this, uh, this slide that it also inflicts a reputational risk on the Chinese banks as well, because the Chinese in, in many ways are banking with many countries, especially the ones that aren't getting finance from the World Bank and so forth, because they explicitly are not the multilateral development banks. I wouldn't necessarily agree with, the, with some of the critiques that they have, um, but they are getting business in many cases because they don't have some of the uh, some of the controversial histories that the western back banks have had over time doing many of these same kind of things uh, over their history although in some cases they've really improved themselves uh, over time and so as these conflicts exacerbate, uh, they're losing their leg up in this uh, financing market um, because they're seen as sidestepping some of these, uh, some of these, some of these real risks and concerns to, to communities. So, in summary, China's doubled the amount of development finance and more than doubled energy finance in the global economy. I'll say that's a good thing. Uh, but Chinese development banks are coming significantly exposed to macroeconomic, climate, social, and reputational risks, which are risk to the global economy, risk to the nations, and, and and social communities around them, um, but also from a China perspective, this is a risk to their own balance sheet. The balance sheets of these two major banks, the CDB, is one of the biggest banks in the world. Uh, to be optimistic, in China, because of the mechanisms and the decision-making processes within these banks, they're poised to change their policies much quicker than, say, the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank does. They don't have a big, huge, uh, controversial board structure uh, where they get, have to debate things for 24 months. A couple guys can make a decision and, uh, and rebalance their balance sheet and uh, really use this very unique engine of global finance to, uh, to do the right thing. Thanks a lot. <laughs> if you didn't get the studies, you can get them, uh, you can get them on our web, web page here, and my publisher would hate me if I didn't uh, also market my new book on China and Latin America. There, there are additional copies in the back for those of you who didn't get any, uh, and also um, there's links on our website as well to the, to the two papers. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Kevin Gallagher and, and Professor Bo Kong for summarizing your, as I said, uh, most comprehensive study of, of what and, 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 and how China is financing its uh, energy investments uh, abroad. Uh, we're going to open for questions, um, and uh, there is uh, mics coming uh, when you have a question. And when you start, please identify yourself as, and your affiliation before starting. But with that, I'm going to start with the question as a prerogative of the chair.
Um, to, to ask a question that maybe the study didn't explicitly address, but maybe you can uh, help us think about this, which is how does one judge the, you've told us what Chinese SOEs and, and banks do, uh, what they do, how they do it, but why are they doing this? And, and how does one judge the efficacy of the policy that, that they're pursuing? And, and, and maybe not so important how we judge it, but how would the Chinese government judge the efficacy uh, of the policy? Uh, what, what are the objectives? How do you measure success? How do you know that, that, that you uh, are doing, uh, uh, going down the right path? I mean, after all, you know, owning half of Venezuela's external debt is not exactly an accomplishment today. Um, so, so it particularly help us understand this in the context of understanding OBOR uh, going forward, one belt, one road, um, and, and uh, assuming that the, the, the practices that they've been following uh, will, will continue more or less the way you have described. Could you uh, speculate on that a little bit for us? Either one of you, whoever you want to start. I'm no China expert. That's why I work with people like Bo. Um, but uh, let, me, let me make two points, and, and you can tell me if I'm completely wrong. Uh, what, what I know much more about is the, the, is the development finance community. And uh, there are 303 national development banks around the world. Uh, this is, uh, and they hold about five to seven trillion dollars worth of assets around the world, uh, much more than the multilateral development banks. And they're key tools for national development in their own countries, and some of them are also internationalized. And, and probably the, the gold standard is the KFW in, in, in Germany, uh, which was founded by the Marshall Plan with the United States. Uh, the Brazilian National Development Bank, also founded by the Marshall Plan uh, in Brazil, is also uh, the, second, the second largest. Uh, second largest national development bank in the world uh, compared, to, compared to China. And they have different, uh, different objectives depending upon what, what the state has. Uh, the KFW's had five or six different lives. Right now it's, it's a global leader in clean energy technology and uh, renewable energy diffusion uh, across the world, trying to make markets ahead of them, right? The, the private sector doesn't go into clean energy technologies because of all the bottlenecks and uncertainties and, and externalities that are out there in the world, and even more so in developing countries. And so the KFW's out there had to create markets in some way there isn't a market for Chinese for Chinese firms uh, across the world because they don't have the capabilities and on the globalization uh, capabilities, um, and they're not. Uh, they wouldn't have the right. They wouldn't be able to uh, price competitively. And so, on some level, not necessarily the same same objective, but uh, the CDB is a is a is a market maker. Um, but in conversations with folks at, at these banks. Uh, they've said that there's a number of number of objectives. Uh, one is to diversify away from the United States Treasuries, right? Uh, they're earning very low yields on these things, and um, uh, and they're very heavily over overexposed. Um, I'd rather be overexposed to us than than Venezuela, but they they see it uh, moving across the world as a way to do that. Secondly, it's a way to advance the national champions policy that they have, sort of the globalization of their national industrial policies. Uh, thirdly, is to expand South-South cooperation. Uh, working with their with their allies and uh, and and so forth, uh, and relatedly, fourth to, to develop learning capabilities for their national firms. That's what they that's what they say to somebody like me uh, when I ask them. But uh, but uh, what do they say to you? <laughs> well, I totally echo what uh, what Kevin has just said, uh, and I I only want to comment on on the first part of the question they had asked. That is why uh, the uh, SOE, energy SOEs and uh, state financial institutions financing the expansion of Chinese energy companies and how do you measure success and um, um, what's, what's your reaction to CDB's uh, um, uh, debt uh, accumulation in, in Venezuela and uh, going forward, uh, what does this all mean for the implementation of the uh, um, road and belt initiative? I'm not sure I, I'm able to answer all these questions but, but um, um, I think based on our study, it's clear that uh, the, um, the energy SOEs and uh, the uh, state financial institutions operate um, like, um, operate in, in, 
operate like a, a quasi-government agency in many, many respects. Um, the, the top managers are appointed as if they are government bureaucrats, as I have argued uh, earlier. In that, in that sense, uh, there is a political logic for the SOEs and the state financial institutions to, um, to um, uh, carry out the state priorities. That is, um, being the, uh, the manager of these SOEs or the, um, um, the, uh, the chairmen of these organizations is not necessarily the, the last stop in their career. It may be the beginning of their political career as a local or national leader. And therefore, uh, in addition to the, um, the incentive to, uh, to build a global competitive organization, uh, what's driving their behavior is also this political reward that, that's embedded in the design of this system. And um, as to the issues uh, of moral hazard or accountability uh, hazard that you, you encounter with respect to instances such as what, what, um, what you see in Venezuela, um, there, I think, as I have argued earlier, uh, an organization like the, CCD, like the CCDB responds to different set of incentives. That's why it oftentimes acts out of whack in the eyes of the West. Uh, on the one hand, the, CC, the CDB would charge an interest rate higher than the World Bank. Uh, it's more commercial than the World Bank. On the other hand, it would turn around and, and provide a, a low interest loan to the CNPC, and it will also... Um, implement the state's objective of uh, providing more finance to Venezuela, which is, uh, which is mired in, in a lot of difficulties. And I think the, my, my sense is that uh, when talking to my Chinese colleagues, um, this is well understood uh, that um, you know, the, the implementation of the Road and Belt Initiative will carry a lot of risks. But you always ask, as a political economist, you, all, all economies always ask what the trade-off is. Um, at home, um, China is also at a very difficult point. When the capacity, um, when there's so much surplus capacity, when it's so difficult, when it's, gonna, it's not clear that China can overcome this middle, middle income trap by um, powering up its innovative engine anytime soon. And when the consumption uh, is still, um, when the consumption-led economy is still taking time to take a root. And as a result, um, many in the Chinese government see this road and belt initiative as uh, an opportunity for China to export capacity overseas, and in turn, the industries in China get an opportunity to move on to the higher value chain. As to whether this will lead to um, a lot of downfalls or a lot of risks, and I think there's enough appetite uh, to bear the consequences of the risks. That's why you see uh, the SOEs taking the charge of this initiative. That is, it's okay if the, as some of the SOEs fail, and we are willing to go, to, we are willing to bear the consequences of these trials. But eventually, they will learn uh, by doing, and they will, they will develop the capability of figuring out how to get things done. And they will have to uh, beat out the competition. They will have to grow in this manner. Otherwise, how do they grow? At home, um, the SOE reform is, is not moving in the direction that, uh, um, that was thought uh, two years ago or, or one year or so ago when the party had, a, uh, had, had rolled out some platform uh, on economic reforms. And clearly, I think increasingly, the One Road, One Belt initiative is seen as a political agenda, more important than an economic idea. Um, that is the political, uh, it, the political importance, in my view, probably far uh, uh, exceeds the important significance. So in that regard, uh, I think uh, the, the design of the system um, actually um, might enable the system to carry out its objective. The only question is uh, at what cost? But then you have to 
analyze that cost um, in connection to the alternative. That is, what is your alternative plan? You can be critical of the development model in China, but what's your alternative? Will your alternative lead to a better solution? I think that's the debate you often um, uh, end up to when you have a conversation on these topics with, with uh, colleagues in China. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. That was very helpful. Uh, question in the back. Gentlemen standing. Always give the guy standing the first question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Thomas Ward. I was a, a economist at the World Bank and following a lot of this. And I, it's interesting you're talking just about the energy sector when you, kind of, you know, when you really look at China, their big push has been more on the infrastructure sector, on the roads and bridges and transport and so forth. But when you're comparing to the bank and the MDBs, they're actually very dwarfed by the private sector bank money coming in to these different places. So a comparison might be also to look at the other global banking money coming through. And then you have places like in Nigeria that you got the Chinese, I think it's ICBE, which is an internal bank giving $6 billion to Nigeria, not through, the big, not through their development banks. You got to look at that aspect of it as well, is their own internal banks. And with that, you also have the export banks. You know, there's 64 around the world that also have a small play, but they're pretty small relative size. So, so are we exaggerating the scale? Well, the, uh, uh, all, that, all that private data is available. You know, as, a, as an academic and a researcher, um, the data on the CDB and the Export-Import Bank just doesn't exist. You can go to any one of the places where we bought the databases for the analysis for the first paper to find out about the ICBC holdings in Nigeria and how they structure, structure their deals. Um, but this is the CDB and the Export-Import Bank are explicit policy banks. Um, and so their family is the MDBs and export credit rating agencies, right? The credit agencies. The CDB is, is sort of both a World Bank and a U.S. Export-Import Bank. It uh, has con concessional and non-concessional components to it. Um, and so that, that was the comparison. That data is, you folks are great, your database, you can download everything you know. Uh, you can't do that on China. And so we just took a stab at the energy. It took two years to build the energy. It took us uh, two years to, before that, just to do all of Latin America and our colleagues at SICE uh, have been working for many years on the, on the Africa component. The Export-Import Bank of the United States just published last week a estimate of CDB's uh, global exposure in general um, and the Export-Import Bank in general um, that's, uh, that's on their webpage. Thank you very much. Bob Eichord from the Atlantic Council. Um, very important uh, piece of work. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to, to talk uh, for you to talk about the linkage that you see between the domestic state of the SOEs in the energy sector and this policy financing, because obviously that is going to be critical, especially in our post-Paris stuff, in terms of how much pressure they're going to be under to export uh, in the fossil energy area as well as in the renewable area, which also has a large surplus capacity. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you see any changes in the policies over the last year as a result of these unprecedented surpluses in industry? Um, and how is that being reflected in individual countries, if you have any of that data? Um, and I would say also the relationship of these policy banks to the IFIs is also, I think, an important trend because I'm seeing more of that as they try to develop these co-financing arrangements with the international banks. Uh, let, let me build on that question a little bit uh, but by asking particularly Bo Kong, who first taught me this principal agency uh, uh, problem that academics talk about. Is it possible that you have political constituencies such as the, 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 the uh, energy SOEs who are gaming the policy, uh, pursuing their own objective on the back of a, a government agenda that may be primarily political, um, just like they gamed the going out policy prior? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question on the domestic linkage uh, between um, 
the um, the domestic the domestic linkage between energy, the energy SOEs, and um, um, and China's uh, uh, attempt to export more. Um, I think what has happened uh, since uh, the global financial crisis uh, is that uh, China's export environment has deteriorated uh, quite significantly. As a result, um, as a result of uh, a series of anti-dumping. Um, um, realities uh, Chinese energy, renewable energy companies have encountered uh, elsewhere. Um, I think there is a clear realization that the, uh, the capacity has to be absorbed at home or in emerging economies somehow. And thus, and this Road and Belt Initiative uh, has an energy component, uh, has an energy infrastructure component, an energy export component. But that alone may not be sufficient to, uh, uh, to address this surplus capacity issue. As a result, the Chinese government over the past couple of years has uh, uh, taken some uh, aggressive measures to pr promote the deployment of renewable energy. I have always um, uh, argued that that is the indicator we should turn to uh, when we try to understand what China is doing on the renewable energy front. Um, it's important, you know, uh, when China marries its manufacturing capacity and the renewable energy push, certainly uh, it will, uh, it's hard to compete uh, um, on, the, on the manufacturing of energy equipment side. But the ultimate answer has to come from the domestic, the domestic uh, attempt or domestic effort to, to deploy renewable energy resource energy for China to make a difference um, with respect to the global effort to, to, to cut, cut back on, on CO2 emissions. And in that res respect, I think the, the external challenges uh, have compelled uh, China to move in that direction. And certainly environmental, the concerns about environmental um, pollution uh, have lent support to that effort as well. Um, there, uh, I think what, what's likely to, uh, to determine the success of this effort to deploy more renewable energy uh, technologies at home uh, boils down to the issue of, of marketization and uh, pricing issue, pricing reforms, and uh, uh, also the reform of SOEs and, uh, and, uh, and the vested interests um, uh, of fossil fuels sector. And as to the, um, I, I'm, I haven't studied the, the connections between the policy banks and the, uh, the international financial institutions that much, but, but the question, I, I'm, you know, I think my colleague may have a better answer, but the interesting part there is, is whether the socialization will help to reshape the identity of these, uh, um, these state-owned financial institutions uh, um, that are increasingly globally uh, active uh, from China. And as far as the energy SOEs and the, the principal agent sort of um, possibility, I think it's clear that based on the empirical work um, many have done um, on, on the implementation of uh, the going out strategy, um, that the energy SOEs or the SOEs in general are quite good at uh, playing this double game of being the agent of the state and being their own, um, their own master um, they play this, uh, they are quite good at performing gymnastics of wearing one hat or, you know, removing, put the, you know, removing another hat. And I think it's, it's, you know, that's why over the past couple of years, I think we have had a lot of conversation in China about uh, the performances of these uh, SOEs. Um, I, I was hoping that this anti-corruption campaign might lead to more discussion about the performances of these SOEs in general. But I think I was to some extent uh, disappointed by the direction of the anti-corruption campaign because that has not led to this overall attempt to, to restructure, to reform the SOEs in general. I think uh, the principal agent relationship exists. The moment you have the separation of ownership and separation of management, and that has existed, uh, you know, uh, all along in the West. But in the West, you have this uh, 
you, you know, you don't have the state ownership in many of these sectors. Therefore, the, the challenges are not that, 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 that uh, acute. But in China's case, the challenges are almost uh, uh, embedded from, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost a, a built in based on the, the, the design of the institutions. I don't think that problem has, re has been resolved. And, and as you pointed out, you don't have capital markets to discipline management. No. No. Uh, so, gentleman in the pink shirt. Hey, uh, thank you so very much for the fascinating discussion. Uh, my name is Winslow Robertson. I'm with the Natural Resource Defense Council. I've seen your presentations many a time, Professor Gallagher. I am wondering if you can speak to um, how much you have heard regarding the China Development Bank and Exim Bank in your discussions, not in the data, on whether if China has peaked its coal consumption, whether external coal-fired power plants are going to be financially viable down the line, um, and the interaction between China's domestic market for coal and China's external market for coal-fired power plants. Thanks, and I'll, I'll sneak in an, uh, an answer uh, to the other question, too, about the, about the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank's uh, relationship with some of the other MDBs and the extent to which there's cross-fertilization. Justin Lin's new book comes out in November, um, and it's about China's development finance approach. And uh, it's, 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 it's uh, causing a whole set of new discussions at the OECD. They're actually rethinking the classification of overseas flows because China is so different than the way that we've traditionally measured it uh, in the West. It's, you know, we are only taking like a lens of looking at these different policy banks, but when, when a delegation from China goes to Ecuador, it's exporters, it's private banks, it's the policy banks, um, and there's a real strong correlation with, well, do we import a lot from this country? If we import a lot from this country, we see a lot of demand. We can loan them against that demand, uh, loan them finance, and we can also get opportunities for our, uh, for our companies. And, and some of that uh, is really hard to classify. It really bumps into some, some perceived norms in, in the West, and uh, it's causing a, a real new discussion about how to classify this kind of finance uh, in, the, in the OECD world. The CDB has joined something called the International Development Finance Club, which is a group of about 100 different uh, development banks around the world, not the multilateral development banks, but things like the KFW, the Brazilian National Development Bank, and so forth. And they've created a working group to get to the, to the climate change uh, uh, question, where they've, they've, they've come up with a measurement, a metric on what is sustainable, what is green finance. Um, and it was, a, it was a slightly different methodology than the MDBs who came up with their own. And in March of 2014, they had a, a negotiation to hash out the differences of it. We did a study on that. We've got some concerns about how they measure it. But they have a measurement of green finance. And the collective of the International Development Finance Cl Club has agreed to have, provide their own $100 billion worth of green finance uh, in between now and 2025. I know for a fact that the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank are now starting to collaborate with some of the MDBs on the project level, and even in a more informal uh, basis, they're doing things like workshops on safeguards, um, workshops on uh, project preparation, uh, risk, risk analysis. They have a whole team now uh, uh, that's looking at the social and environmental impacts of things around the uh, uh, Silk Road Initiative. Um, at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, a part of the, uh, uh, the 2015 uh, communique said that not only, uh, not only do the United States and China commit to controlling public investment flowing in projects with high pollution and carbon emissions, both domestically and international, and I know that there's, there's a, uh, a push to try to make that more strategic. I guess what we're hoping for is that at the G20, this really becomes a, a, a core minted uh, set of objectives. We know that one of the things that China wants to coin and, and, and really make a mark on at the G20 is the concept of green finance. And there's all sorts of, uh, they're going to create some new funds, they're going to really uh, uh, make a big deal about their green bond market, which is now the biggest in the world. Um, and there's a lot of conversation and pressure um, to uh, square some of the interesting domestic coal policies that they have with, uh, with some of the national ones. Around Paris, they were not prepared to sign the OECD uh, communique that uh, limits coal finance. Um, but there's a, there's a big conversation about it. And the, the question 
it should be your your question, the gentleman with the pink shirt from NRDC, should is part Bo Conga and part Kevin Gallagher. It's it, it um, there's a big political force where because you have excess capacity at home and a policy commitment to uh, not build any new plants, and so there's a big political push to move into the gasification on the domestic end um, and to and to globalize it. And what the China Development Bank uh, said to us in, after we released this study is that they have, you know, and, and they, they said, shame on me because I'm a PhD economist, is that all, there's a demand and supply of, of each one of these <laughs> things. And uh, if you remember, China's general foreign policy is not really to muddle in the domestic uh, policies of the host governments, and they say that the host governments are asking for the coal plants. And so it's not just if China changes it that there's a lot of countries that are asking for, we want this coal plant financed. And when China says, okay, and they look and they say, well, we've got some firms mm -hmm. that can help with that, um, and we import the coal from you, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it becomes win-win for them. But China pulling back is only going to be one part of, the, uh, of it. That's, that's, what they're, that's what they're saying in response to us. Paul? Peak coal at home and growing coal abroad? I, I think that Kevin has answered that question uh, very well, and I, 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 I'm okay. of the same view. You, you certainly have the, um, the incentive structure in place that, uh, that prompts the, the coal players to export their capacity whenever there's a, there's a demand uh, overseas. And the, the Chinese um, financial institutions, state financial institutions, are simply the matchmaker. Uh, they, they make that, that work happen. And as far as they are concerned, if they uh, uh, bumped against, uh, if they bump against a local backlash, and then they would just reevaluate these projects. And part of the process involves their learning by doing. And uh, if you go back and look at the history of the CDB, how the CDB behave, so how the CDB became so globally active, it involves a lot of learn, a lot of interactions with some of um, the best investment banks and best. Uh, um, bankers from the rest of the world. A lot of them, of course, come from the Wall Street, right? So they have incorporated many of these uh, uh, tactics. So when, when, when Chinese financial institutions go abroad, they oftentimes go back to the same toolkit of the Western, uh, of the, uh, their international development bank peers. And this, a lot of times they just copy, um, you know, the, the tools. And, um, and I think, uh, um, um, you know, but the Chinese government is also very sensitive about uh, the image. It tries to, pro to project. Um, so you have two forces that, uh, that uh, uh, are, are crossing each other. Oftentimes they work for cross purposes, but, but whenever you see a lot of tensions, when you see uh, China in the spotlight, uh, the, these players can actually um, get synchronized and they actually will be straightened up by the Chinese government. Sounds like a lot like the American policy on exporting tobacco to me, but what do I know? Uh, gentlemen there. Uh, we're down to the end of our time, so we're going to take a group of questions and then you all can pick which questions you want to answer. Uh, hi, Jonathan Chanis, New Tide Asset Management. I wanted to ask about value destruction. I mean, when a bank lends a dollar, it wants to get a dollar back plus profit. Uh, certainly the U.S. industry has not been that great in terms of value uh, production, and the losses in the U.S. have not been small, but relative to the financial system, they're actually very manageable. Do you, uh, and you look at some of the Chinese investments in Brazil and Sudan, in Venezuela, even Nexium and the Chesapeake investments have been pretty, arguably, poor investments. If, in the work you've done, if you were to mark these portfolios to market and try to truly come up with an impaired estimate, what, what do you think that number would be? And is there any risk of financial instability, particularly from term mismatching? Are the bonds that they've floated, you know, of shorter duration or longer duration than loans? Or how does that shape up? Can there be a financial issue? And when we look at the Chinese government's behavior as opposed to the agent principal problem, um, might not this be a very smart thing for the government because the political short-term gains of lending to Venezuela are so much more beneficial than the probabilities of losses five or ten years from now that it's a very smart move? I'm a Lieutenant Christopher Knudsen. I uh, just got back from spending a couple years over in Asia. And uh, I, 
I want to say like, I'm new to this, so I, I don't have a background in economics or finance, but I was wondering, uh, how is the standard of living for the locals living in countries after China has uh, launched some sort of investment? I mean, I see right here that the uh, contracts go with the Chinese company, so I'm assuming Chinese workers possibly are coming over there to work on it. And then the money is, uh, or you know, the commodities are, are taken out of the country, and uh, if they're unable to repay in commodities, like the countries have to come up with uh, a lot of local currency to, to, to uh, you know, I guess, finally, you know, to pay off that loan. Uh, so if you take a country that has had a Chinese uh, company invest in it as opposed to a country that has not, uh, over time, is the standard of living that much higher for those uh, countries with that investment? Uh, hi, I'm Hannah, graduate from SAIS. I have a question. Like China has exported a lot of renewable energy investment in Europe um, from solar wind to um, uh, nuclear in France. However, in contrast, there are a few uh, petroleum investment in Europe if we accept Euro Russia from the European continent. So I wonder um, what kind of the reason behind uh, this um, situation. Thank you. Um, Paul, you want to start? Um, let me let me try to um, answer the last question first. Uh, I think the uh, Carnegie Endowment, uh, uh, my colleagues at uh, Carnegie Endowment uh, have uh, um, just recently done a, a, a paper on this topic, and it will come out pretty soon. I encourage you to I encourage you to take a look at it when it, it uh, gets released. But basically, I think it's a. a you know, the, basically the, the reality is that there is Chinese investment in, in the petroleum sector, in the oil and gas sector in Europe, but it just takes a different form. Uh, it happens uh, in a much small, on a much smaller scale. Um, and the, the reason why there is, uh, the reason has not seen so much larger scale investment, except uh, the uh, ne next in case, um, that involves um, involves uh, North Sea and, and and of course some some part of Britain as well. Um, the reality is that the Europe is a net importer, um, you know, by and large, and and the geology is 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 the fundamental factor. Um, um, and and moreover, um, there are other alternatives that are uh, awfully better. <laughs> with respect to investment rate of returns and, and opportunities. And with respect to the financial risks and value destruction versus val value production, um, it's, it's awfully hard to figure out to whether or not uh, the Chinese energy companies or Chinese financial institutions have, have um, made more money versus uh, uh, you know, another possibility that they have lost, uh, you know, money. And what's the rate of return for the investment assets over, over you know, around the world? And I think what McKinsey has done some uh, empirical studies for different periods of time, and their studies show that uh, prior to, to the global financial crisis, by and large, Chinese NLCs, Chinese oil companies, um, have, have made some pretty good bets around the world. I certainly, based on my own empirical work, uh, I certainly have concluded that uh, prior to, you know, uh, uh, 2000, 2007, 2008, Chinese companies actually have, have, have uh, had a really good uh, rate of return above, you know, right, right around 15% or so, higher than some of the IOCs. Uh, you know, uh, take, a, take a look at uh, the Tarara oil field in, in Peru, for example. That became a cash cow for CNPC. Uh, before CNPC acquired that field, it produced 800 barrels a day. And then when oil prices rebounded, of course, it generate it became a cash cow. And even Sudan, then you talk to uh, this, the you talk to folks at CNPC, they would tell you that yes, you know, oh, since the uh, since the independence of South Sudan, since the the civil war, uh, so the operations there are hard to uh, to sustain. But but if you look at the early period of of the operation, CNPC made a lot of money, and plus. The, the folks at CNPC will tell you that, hey, the assets are not going anywhere. We are not giving that assets up, right? And so it's hard to, to, to look at an extended period of time and try to determine 
the financial performance of that investment. I think it's hard to generalize. And I don't know if, if my colleague has a, has a better take on this, but um, I, that's a question that, that I've been uh, scratching my head about for quite a while. I, I don't have a good answer. And, uh, and, uh, and so I, I think, why don't I turn it to you and sure. if you have a panel. Sure, I mean, it really, you know, uh, when we ask the same kind of question to, to our Chinese colleagues, they say that's not, that's not the right question because right. they say that uh, these, these loans is that they, they truly have a long run view. The, many, the maturity mm -hmm. on these is, is 20 years and so they've, they've got a different, different, right. uh, different horizon on, on when, you're get, when you get that profit. Um, and you might get a lot in three years and a lot more in 15 years is just what they're saying. And they say when, they're, when their countries are really risky, that they've secured it a lot in, uh, they've secured the loans in commodities, but you say, well, the commodity prices have also gone down and so the value of their, of their currencies. And they say, well, we have a long run view on commodity prices too. And then the third uh, answer that, uh, that you get is that the development banks are bearing the risk or paying for the positive externalities of the learning of the different firms. And so if the China Development Bank takes a little bit of a loss, but, chi but uh, uh, Chinese companies learn how to build oil rigs in parts of the Atlantic Ocean that have a totally different set of geology and tectonics that, uh, that they're used to off the coast of China, then that's a benefit for them. It's part of the process because, of, because mm -hmm. it's a policy bank, right? Yeah. And, and so, and so that's, that's stuff that's hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify the cost of carbon. It's hard to quantify the spillover benefits of, uh, of other things. And so it's not, it's not a bank that can say, oh my gosh, it's hit this price, let's dump it, right? Because they're not going to dump uh, many of these assets. I, I tend to think that the, that the uh, political part is a little overblown. I mean, what, what is the political benefit and what, or what has been the political benefit of being engaged with Venezuela? Like, what, what did China get from that relationship? What was Venezuela in the region even during the highest Chavez years? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't doing anything, you know, it was, Peers have been making a mess at home, but they didn't have any major impacts on any real anything that happened in the region. The uh, gentleman's question um, over here: uh, I have not seen a study uh, that has tried to look at the independent impact of development bank finance in any country on its economic growth. There is a gentleman at. Uh, at George Washington, Steve Kaplan, who's looked at the independent impact of Chinese development bank finance on uh, government fiscal pol policy space. And it's, it's, it's clearly allowed governments, especially governments with uh, weaker credit ratings or that haven't had access to capital markets like Ecuador, to be able to invest in capital formation that it never would have if it, uh, if it only had Western capital markets as its, as its uh, as its uh, only opportunity. Um, if you, you know, if you bundle together Chinese trade, finance, and foreign direct investment, uh, it had a major impact on economic growth in Latin America and Africa in between 2003 and 2013. Unfortunately, the majority of the countries, and I'd put the blame on the host countries, didn't take the, those windfall profits during the commodity boom and the investment boom that was accelerated from, uh, from China to uh, create sovereign wealth funds, to recapitalize their development banks, to invest in social and environmental policy, and to have uh, Chilean-like uh, commodities funds for stabilization for the prices. Unfortunately, they consumed too much of the uh, benefits, and it went to the very higher epilons, uh, echelons of the income stream. And now, as the growth isn't there, the Chinese demand isn't there, and the U.S. and European Union hasn't picked up enough to pick up the, the lack of the Chinese slack, all these countries are uh, are, are sliding uh, pretty pretty significantly. That's a plug for my book, The China Triangle. Uh, well, and to be fair, if we're going to judge China on those standards, we have to judge our own development uh, uh, l lending as well as our, our um, uh, 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 Western investments uh, um, in these countries on, on the same basis. I, I think the, the issue of learnings and, and whether Chinese is in the transition period is a really important one. Uh, just recently, just this year, we've seen China refuse to pay for asset values in Russian properties, for example, that the Indians were eager to jump into. So, so there is something going on. The, 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 they are learning from their experience, as you suggested. There may be a transition period, whether Chinese state-owned enterprises over time becomes true um, multinationals uh, uh, or not. 
uh, is, is a space definitely worth watching. I agree with both that uh, there's been some uh, slippage in the last year or two on the whole SOE reform uh, issue that was so prominently uh, announced uh, in the third plen uh, party plenum uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, but um, this is a reason to invite you back to uh, give us uh, a, a second look a couple years from now on, on how that transition is taking place. So uh, please join me in thanking our two professors. Thank you.